My name is Jerome Kim. I was born in, uh, in 1959, so I'm 62. My grandmother was actually born in Hawaii. First Korean immigrants to hit Hawaii, um, 1905, I think. My grandmother completed high school in Hawaii, which is unusual in her generation, and then went to college in Los Angeles. Um, and they developed a series of things called English Standard Schools. So my father, uncle, and, and aunt all went to the set of English Standard Schools that, you know, was, I guess, the college preparatory lane in those days. My grandfather didn't arrive until 1910. His story is different. He grew up here, um, actually was a student of a very famous um, Confucian scholar, uh, and then became active in the um, discussions around independence. I guess did something that upset the Japanese and uh, had to leave. His father, who had uh, some sort of diplomatic passport, gave it to him and said, take this. And he went to Wonsan and took a, 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 sh a ferry, I guess, from Wonsan to Vladivostok. They were stopped by a Japanese warship and boarded. And uh, so he hid in the latrines and made it to Vladivostok. And apparently they didn't have any Russian money. They didn't, none of them spoke Russian. And they were starving and thirsty. And I guess people shared bread with them. And they made it to Europe. He then went to uh, England, boarded a, um, a ship in England, and ended up in New York. And then he uh, met my grandmother in Los Angeles. They were married, and they went back to Washington, where he was supposed to be, um, I guess, the permanent representative of the Korean independence movement in Washington. And then they were waiting to be sent to, to Europe. But of course, money was always an issue for the Korean independence movement, so he had to raise funds, and they eventually ended up in Hawaii, which is where she was from. Uh, and he worked to organize the Korean communities to collect money for the independence movement uh, and to edit the, new, the local newspaper, the Korean newspapers. But they continued you know, until 1945 to provide money to Korean independence um, efforts. Hawaii actually uh, is very unusual. So you do occasionally see these uh, families that have been there three or four generations also. So in, in my generation, um, the language, uh, the daily language was English. My mother and father uh, didn't really speak Korean. My grandmother spoke Korean because um, my grandfather did. We ha were forced in the third, fourth, and fifth grade to take Japanese because I think pe someone had decided that Japan was going to be the next Pacific superpower. We all had to learn Japanese. We watched this um, Korean drama. I, what was it called? Um, it was about the time when, um, as Korea was being taken over by the Japanese. It has some pictures of the uh, second to the last king who became the emperor and the Japanese legate and delegation and the Americans who were there. And I thought, you know, this is the time when my grandfather was here. And I wonder, you know, what he saw and what he was thinking, because none of that got written down. And, you know, what was Korea really like when they opened up their first uh, streetcar or first um, train? And did the Japanese really pay for it? Uh, and why was it that the Koreans couldn't do what the Japanese did? Did they start late? The, reading the history and, and knowing a bit more now has let me think about um, my grandfather, um, our families, and how they ended up in Hawaii, and, and what, what it was like, uh, potentially, at, at the time. It, it, and of course, that was all fictional. Went to the University of Hawaii, and you know, with all these advanced credits and things, I could graduate in three years. And so I did. And then my dad said, you know, I, we don't have money for medical school, so you'll have to get a scholarship. So one of my cousins, um, who was a doctor in the U.S. Army, said, you should do this program where the military pays for your uh, medical school and pays you a stipend. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll try. And I ended up joining the Air Force. And so they put me through Yale. At the end of that, they said, you know, we don't have enough space in our hospitals to train everybody, so if you want to do a civilian fellowship, residency and fellowship, go ahead. So I applied to Duke and got in and and did my internship, residency, and fellowship there, became staff there, got two grants there, and I wrote to the Air Force and said, you know, can I, can I stay here an extra four years until my grant is done? And that was the beginning of the Gulf War. It was August of 1990. And they wrote back and said, who are you? And why don't we know about you? <laughs> and 
we're, we think we're going to bring you on board as a, during the war. So in January, um, on the, I think on the day that the air war started in Iraq, I started officer training in Texas. And, um, and then did one month at a hospital. It was a very short war. Uh, one month in a hospital in Texas, and then they said, you know, we're doing research on HIV vaccines, and we need to send someone from the Air Force there. We think you would be a good candidate, so why don't you go to work with Bob Redfield at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research? So Bob Redfield was the, is the former head of CDC. So we went to Baltimore, um, and after two years, I wasn't doing a lot of research. I had to really take care of patients, um, AIDS patients. Um, Baltimore had a huge uh, um, problem with HIV infection. Uh, to treat the entire world for HIV, that it's called PEPFAR, and then led um, at least part of the COVID response during the previous administration, said, we'd like to have you back, um, and you know we'll give you a lab. We want you to do HIV vaccine trials for us. So I joined the, switched from the Air Force to the Army, went back to work for the same group of people and friends. We, you know, announced the trial. We figured out why the vaccine protected. And um, my lab did um, sequencing, and we were able to show that not only did it protect, but the viruses that escaped um, carried mutations in them. The same way we talk about mutants now for COVID, uh, HIV has uh, mutations that allow it to escape from vaccines. And actually, there are some things about HIV vaccines uh, and for instance, vaccines against cholera or typhoid, that are similar, not in the amount of money that's assigned. And HIV vaccines get a lot more funding than cholera vaccines, but in the sense that it's difficult to convince companies to work on HIV vaccines in the same way that it's almost impossible to get them to think about working on uh, the, the vaccines that we work on because the populations that are affected by these vaccines are all in... Um, low and middle income countries, and they're not going to pay a lot for vaccines. They can't. It was a similar problem, and, and it was a very different way of looking at it. And, you know, we have a lot of strong support from the Korean government, the Indian, Swedish, and Finnish governments, and then the Gates Foundation. And, and that really, you know, opened my eyes about the possibilities in vaccines and, and what they can do and what the limitations of our current model for vaccines being in the military meant that, that we had to move, we would theoretically have to move every two to three years anyway. And, and I was very lucky because I, you know, started in Washington, went to Hawaii for a very brief period of time, then went to Thailand, and then was basically back in Washington uh, until I retired. Travel and working in other countries, um, and again, I'm speaking now as an American of Korean descent, is, is, is always um, eye-opening. and. Make, and opens your mind to the different possibilities that um, people around the world have. Um, coming to Korea um, is, is different in a sense. I mean, it opens your mind to what uh, Korea has become and what the potential that's here. So again, my, my daughters are, what I, I guess we call third culture kids um, because they have grown up in, mul in lots of different locations. Actually, one of my daughters found a YouTube thing on um, being a military kid. And, um, you know, well, were you here? Oh, you were in Germany? We were in Germany. And, and so, and she had that experience. So th I hope that it gives them a better appreciation. So I don't know if they'll come back to Korea f for good. And, um, and I would guess that they're going to end up going where their uh, careers and jobs and family uh, take them. Because in the end, you know, I think many of us, uh, particularly those of us who work internationally, have a very internationalist perspective. Um, and are very open to differences and changes and different kinds of food and, and different opportunities. And the opportunity to cooperate and collaborate, I think, has been something that has really um, at least driven my career. I mean, working with the Thai government on the trial, working here in Korea with multiple governments, including the Korean government, really gives you a perspective on um, what's possible when we work together. And, um, and COVID, although I, I guess some people are very critical of the American effort, um, the American government actually engaged companies that, that weren't exclusively American. But it gets to the idea that in order to solve the big problems, that we're going to have to count on the best talents from everywhere. And I think that, you know, IVI with its, you know, we think of ourselves as being headquartered in Korea, but a lot of our work is not actually here. It's, it's in Africa or South Asia or in Latin America. And, um, and it's only possible because we can collaborate with people around the world. Um, 
sometimes the language makes it an issue. On the one hand, on the other hand, you know, we will then find people to work for IVI or find people who work there who um, can communicate with people uh, who are trying to do the job here. So I think that that's really, um, it's been a lesson in how to work in a different culture. I mean, because it is, it, Korean work culture is very different from the American military and from the American academic, but I think it's, it has strengths. And, and part of being successful is using the strengths in each country um, to create something that is uh, valuable and, um, and useful. And for, in, in our case, useful for uh, the world. My name is Dr. Jerome Kim. I'm the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul, South Korea. And this is my Korean American story. Mm -hmm.